Let's sing it. Yeah, we can start from here, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's right. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm doing it from this side today. This morning, I tried using that microphone, and it flipped out, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. So I don't have to touch this, so I can just talk to you. I want to introduce our two lovely people. One is Sandy Lissy. Could you stand up, sweetheart? And this is, this is Pastor Lissy's wife, and what an addition she is to him. It's, it's lovely to have a husband and wife here with us today. Uh, I also want to tell you that after the service, make sure you hand in your ballots, and also 
there'll be question and answers over in the North X. We're having coffee. Huh? Oh, yeah, Fellowship Hall. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to have coffee and punch and a few little bites to eat. But at this time, I'd like to introduce Pastor Gary Lizzie from Arizona, who's graciously came across the country to be with us and give us the word of God today. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having Sandy and I with you today. It is such an honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you also for the rain. Sandy and I haven't seen rain in about four or five months. We, we didn't know what to make of it when we saw it. What is this, what is this wet stuff? So it was great to, have, to see rain, but it is a pleasure to be here. And I really look forward to meeting everyone afterwards. And thank you again for, for being here. Uh, we rise to begin our worship service. Begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may love you and magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I invite you to take a moment to reflect upon your sins of this past week. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained servant of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, in this day, you open the way of, ever, of eternal life to every race and nation by the promised gift of your Holy Spirit. Shed abroad this gift throughout the world by the preaching of the gospel, that it may reach to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the word of the Lord. Good morning. Our first lesson for this Pentecost Sunday is found in Genesis 11th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar from mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speak in the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from, from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. The word of the Lord. Let us read responsibly Psalm 143. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. The enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me, and my heart is dismayed. I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works, and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. I thirst for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Show me the way I should go, for you, my 
Rescue me from my enemies, Lord, for I hide myself in you. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. Our second lesson today comes from the book of Acts, the second chapter, beginning at the first verse. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia. <coughs> Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of, our, of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great glorious day of the Lord and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. According to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own, they belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I've told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the, that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come, let us leave. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. 
Good morning. Before we begin, in your bulletins for this morning, you will find message notes that look just like this. Uh, I would like everyone to please pull them out. You're in church, and I'm watching, so I can see that everyone's pulling them out. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I ask everyone to pull out a pen or a pencil uh, and, and follow along. Guys, if you don't have a pen or a pencil... I encourage you to ask one of the nice ladies sitting around you, and I bet you a dollar to a donut that they will have an extra one for you. The reason we're doing this is because the Bible is very clear that the Word of God is the inerrant, infallible Word of God, that God wrote through His Holy Spirit. And anytime we read God's Word, because it's the perfect Word of God, It'll resonate in our heart. There's no way we can read it and not have effect on us. In fact, sometimes you'll, we'll read God's Word, and during the, the week, something will happen that will actually relate to what we read. So I really encourage you uh, to interact with this, to take notes, because I'm sure that you will hear, hear something today or read something today in Scripture that will help you this week. So today, we are looking at times in our life when we get stuck. Times in our life when we get stuck. Have you ever felt stuck in life? Where you're heading along in life and things are going just as you planned. Everything's going the right way. Things are clicking on all cylinders and all of a sudden life throws you a curveball. Something you didn't expect. And it can happen in an instant, in a moment, and your life changes. And you feel like what is in front of me is, mon is monumental. It's a, 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 a hill too big to climb, and I don't want to be where I'm at now, but I can't go back. And we get stuck. Anyone here ever live in the north? Am I? Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm not the only Yankee here. <laughs> um, I, when I served in South Dakota, uh, it's the prairies and winters were brutal. Okay? Minus 20, snowstorms. But the thing is, is that snowstorms could come up in an instant. So you could be indoors, and a minute later you could walk out and you'd have three feet of snow. And so this it would be kind of dangerous because uh, you'd be, I'd be making a hospital visit or a shut-in call, and I'd come out, and there'd be a blizzard and be all this snow, and it would just be, you know, kind of dangerous, right? And the problem is, is driving into town where I lived, these small towns, you only had one road that would take you into town and out of town. But you kind of know that with a 501, don't you? <laughs> Sandy and I got stuck in traffic going down to the beach. There's one road, so you know what it's like. So this one day, I was at the, at, at the nursing home. I was making visits. I got out. There's a storm. There's these winds. And with winds come snow drifts. And I'm driving back home. I'm on this one-lane road. The only way to get into town, well, sort of. You can go in one way. Or you go all the way around town, which you wouldn't want to do. And I'm driving down the street very carefully. And right up ahead of me, I see the snowdrift. A big snowdrift. Now, living in South Dakota, I learned a secret. The secret is, is you can actually drive through a snowdrift. But there's a skill to it. You're laughing. <laughs> but hold on. <laughs> There's a secret to it. Okay? If you go too slow, you'll get stuck. If you go too fast, you'll go off the road and go into a cornfield. Neither is good. Right? So I'm looking at this snowdrift. I'm like, it's a pretty big snowdrift, but I really don't feel like driving out down the one-lane road all the way through town again. I think I can do it. 
So I braced myself. I was like, okay, Gary, you can do this. And I put the, the gas pedal down, and I'm, I'm heading towards this snow drift. And right before I hit it, I had a, a, a loss of nerve. And I pulled up on the gas pedal, and I went right into the snowbank, and whoosh, like a big pillow. So then I'm stuck. And if anyone's ever been stuck in snow, what's the first thing you do? Put it in reverse, right? I put it in reverse. I backed up, and I made a little bit of traction, got just a little bit of way, and I put it back in a drive, and I almost made it through, but I got stuck again. And I'm thinking to myself, I said, Gary, too bad I don't have someone driving shotgun. Because if I had someone with me, I could put it in drive, they could get out behind the car and push. I thought, ah, thought to myself, self, you're a smart guy. Put it in drive, open up the door, go around to the back of the car and push. So I got out, remember it's snowing, minus 20 degrees. I get out behind the car and I'm pushing. And as I'm pushing, not really making any, any headway, and all of a sudden there's a huge wind. Whoosh, and my door slams shut. By the way, what happens when you're in drive and your door shuts? I heard that horrible sound. Click. And I was like, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> so I start walking down, and here comes this old farmer in a beat-up beat up old Ford pickup truck. And he looks down, he sees me in my clerical collar, and he goes, hey, Reverend, let me tell you something. If they call me Gary, great. Pastor Gary, great. When they call me Reverend, that usually means they don't like me very much. He wasn't a member of my church. He goes, Reverend, what happened? I tell him the story. He goes, well, that's not very smart. <laughs> no, it wasn't. He goes, well, get in, and I'll drive you to the house, and you can pick up the spare key. By the time I get back, there's two state troopers, five pickup trucks, most people from my church, wondering where I am. And he says, Reverend, can I give you a hint, a tip? I said, yeah. He goes, We're like a half a mile away. He goes, I'm going to let you out here. Just wander around holding your head saying, Orville, I think we can fly. <laughs> Getting stuck isn't fun. But sometimes it's not a car getting stuck in snow, is it? Sometimes getting stuck is going to the doctors and having the doctor say, you know what, we found something on your x-ray that we don't like. It might be cancer. It might be walking down the street and falling, and it's taking a lot longer to heal than you had thought. It might be a car accident. Or maybe someone walks into work and they've worked in the same business for a lot of years, and their employer says, can you come into my office? I've got something to share with you. I'm sorry, but we're downsizing, and we have to let you off. And all of a sudden, in a matter of moments, your world changes. And nothing's the same ever again. And you get stuck. And you get stuck in this wilderness. And let me tell you something about being stuck in the wilderness. When you're stuck in the wilderness, it's really easy for our faith to turn brittle and die. Or, we can let God transform us and transform our hearts. So today, we're going to talk about being stuck. And I really want to talk about God's people, the Israelites. Because for 400 years, the Israelites were slaves. They were in Egypt, and they cried out to God, God, please save me. Please save me. And after 400 years, this is what we get. It's on your notes. Exodus 3.8, God says, So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So, they're in Egypt. 
They're slaves. God's bringing them out to the promised land. It's a land that begins with the letter C. Does anyone know what it is? No, not Colorado. What is it? Cana. Now Israel. A mere 250 miles. It's about the same distance as it is if we drove from here to Jacksonville, Florida. How long would that take us? Who said eight hours? You walking? <laughs> maybe, maybe six, right? But the Israelites, right, the Israelites, they had over 600,000 people, right? And it would take them four to six months to get to this promised land. The land flowing with milk and honey and Oreo blizzards and key lime pie and no liver with onions. But along the way, along the way they get stuck. There's a bunch of detours. Does anyone know how long it actually took them to make that 250 mile journey from point A to point B? 40 years. 40 years they're stuck in the wilderness. I call it the land in between. The land that they want to go to, they can't go back, and now they're stuck. So Exodus 13 says this. Where is God in the, life of, 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 in the middle of life's detours? Here it is, Exodus 13. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though it was what? Though it was shorter. When we're stuck and we're healing or we want to get over hurt and pain, don't we want to run through it and get through it as soon as possible? And sometimes God takes us on a shorter, on a longer journey, even though it's shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around around by the desert road toward the Red Sea, and the Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Ready for battle. Why would God send them on a longer journey? Because it's in these journeys that God begins to teach us. When we're stuck, when we're in a place we don't want to be, we hate it, but God begins to teach us. He begins to work on our heart. So this is what happened, Exodus 13. Where is God in the middle of all this anyway? By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar, a cloud to guide them. Isn't that great? You know what that is? That's a divine GPS. Wouldn't it be great when you have to make a decision between two things if you prayed and God said, okay, I'm going to put a pillar, a pillar of fire over the right decision, right? So a gal wants to get married. Lord, what man should I marry? And a pillar of smoke lands on the guy that she should marry. And clouds cover all the ugly guys, right? So God is leading them. Even in the middle of the wilderness, even when they're stuck, God is leading. But this is when they hit their very first detour. Look at this. It's in your notes. Exodus 15. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. Detour number one. They have no water. When they came to Mara, they could not drink it because it was what? Bitter. bitter. It was bitter. That is why it's called Mara. So the people grumbled against Moses. I want you to underline that. They grumbled against Moses. Now, understand this. If you've ever had children, and you've taken a road trip, 
you know what this is like, right? Driving along, mom, mom, Charlie's hitting me. Dad, 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 I'm hungry. Mom, 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 I got to use the bathroom, right? I mean, it's, it's a lot of grumbling. But in their defense, they're thirsty, right? They've been on this long journey, supposed to take just a short time. They're not there yet. The land of milk and honey and Oreo blizzards just beyond the ridge, and they're stuck in the wilderness. And they're thirsty. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they find it. Water! Water! Where did they get this from? Philadelphia? <laughs> oh, right. Oh. They're bitter. The water's bitter. And they're grumbling. And I want you to notice it's no longer just the water that's bitter. What else has become bitter? Their hearts. Isn't there a lesson in that for us? Sometimes, when we get stuck, and we're not where we want to be, and the wheels kind of come off, our hearts start to get bitter. Remember what I said. When we're stuck and we're in the wilderness, our hearts can become brittle and bitter, and our faith dies, or it could be transformed. It's really a matter of the heart. There goes my walk. And so here's the question I have for you. Because everyone goes through this. Everyone goes through this, this wilderness. When you get stuck, will you allow your heart to grow bitter? Or will you let God make your heart better? Because it's times when we're stuck. Times when we're in places, situations we never want to be in. That God really begins to work in us. That God begins to work. In life's toughest moments, God calls us to trust Him. We're going to see this is what it's all about. Learning to trust in God. Because guess what? God has a perfect track record. And he says, I want you to trust me, because what happens is this. When we're stuck in the land in between, we often get stuck in thinking about the what-ifs. What are the what-ifs? What if I had never said that thing that I wish I hadn't said? Maybe this relationship would have, been, would have ended. What, what if she took... This road, this, this, this road, instead of that road, maybe she never would have gotten into an accident. What if, what if I had walked this way instead of that way? Maybe I never would have fallen. What if I had just gone to the doctors a month sooner? And we begin wallowing in the what-ifs instead of trusting in God. Exodus 15 says, So Moses cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. And Moses threw it into the water, and this made the water good to drink. So Moses throws a piece of wood into the water, and it becomes sweet. And I want you to see this. In the book of Exodus, we have a beautiful foreshadowing of Jesus on the cross. Because Jesus comes into this world and He lives the perfect life and He takes all the bitterness of sin and He takes it on Himself. He takes every creepy, cruddy, ugly thing you and I have ever done, thought about, said, and He buries it in the deepest ocean. So that it can never be seen again. 
So that when God looks at you, he says, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. This is my son. This is my daughter whom I love. You see, Jesus used bitterness to give us eternal life and forgiveness. And he calls us to have a spirit of trust rather than a spirit of complaint. How do we do that? That's a good question. In the middle of all of this, in the middle of being stuck, in the middle of being places we don't want to be in the desert, how, how do we do that? Simply by knowing this. And that is every single thing that happens to you in your life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, God will bring it together. And he'll bring good out of it. He'll bring positive out of all the stuff. In fact, this is what Paul says. I'm not making this up. Paul says in Romans 8, and we know that in some things, is that what it says? In all things. In all things. God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In everything that happens, even when we can't see it, God is bringing good out of it. While we're praying down here, God is working up there. It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of trusting. So here's the question. The big question of the day. What do we do when we're stuck? What do we do when we're stuck? What do we do when we're in a place we don't want to be? And we just keep wanting to look back. And we think, if only this had happened, life would be so much better. What do we do? Here's the problem. When thing, bad things happen, because of our human nature we tend to focus and look solely at the problem. We begin to look solely at what's wrong when we should be focusing on God. We run away from God instead of running to God who's the only one who can solve the problem. The only one to, who helps, and yet we tend to look the other way. And that's when we become bitter. Now, I want you to see this. The reason that we become bitter, and it's easy to become bitter, is because of fear. Because we're afraid of what the future holds. Again, what happens if this is cancer? What happens if I don't get better? What happens if this doesn't work out? And we become fearful and then bitter. Listen to what happens in Exodus 16.3. Follow along. The, the Israelites, they already, they already went through the water. Remember, they were thirsty. God gave them water. Then they say this. A little bit later on. If only, except you have to say this in a whiny way. Because that's what they, the Israelites were doing. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, oh they... They moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. They forget about the part that they were enslaved and forced into hard labor, right? But now you have brought us into the wilderness to starve us to death. I want you to see this. At first, they were grumbling against two. Moses. Who are they grumbling against now? God. You see how this works? You see what happens is, when we get stuck, we start looking backwards. Because in front, the future just seems huge. Right? It seems huge. We can't climb that mountain, we think. And so we end up looking back. In fact, let me just see a raise of hands, because I want to make sure I'm not the only one. If anything bad has ever happened to you, 
Has anyone here ever asked God, why me? You see a raise of hands. Whew, glad I'm not the only one. A better question than why me is, God, what are you working in me during this time? What are you doing in my life? What are you working in my heart? Because God's always preparing something. Remember, God never, ever wastes a hurt. He never wastes a hurt. He never squanders a pain. He's always using it for something better. And it's all about trust. It's all about God basically says over and over and over, trust me. In the middle of this, in the middle of this place you don't want to be, trust me. Trust me that I'll make it right. Trust me that I'll make it better. You all had sin problems, and I solved that. Don't you think I can solve your problems now? Exodus 16 says this. The Lord said to Moses, here's the second detour. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat. Praise God, there's steak on the menu. And in the morning you will be filled with bread. And then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes of frost. When I was a kid, I used to think it was frosted flakes. Yummy. <laughs> Not frosted flakes. On the ground, appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites, when they saw it, they came up there looking at it, and they saw it, and they said to each other, What is it? <laughs> For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Manna literally means, what is it? But it was God doing what? Proving again, I will provide for you. I will provide for your greatest need. I will soothe your greatest hurt. I will still the pain. I'll give you hope when you thought there was no hope. And I will make beautiful what was once dead and make it alive again. And so that I have a question I've got to ask you. When bad times come, where does your heart go for your daily strength? Do you go to yourself? Do you look around you and say, oh, maybe over here, maybe over there? Or do you go to God, who promises, I will help, and I will make it right, and I will heal you. If you have any questions, just look to the empty tomb. The thing is, is when we worry, we forget to go to God. And we begin to look to ourselves. How can I solve this problem? How can I make this better? How can I hedge my bets so I don't mess up and I don't lose? That's what happened. Listen to this. Then the manna was like coriander seed and looked like resin. The people went around gathering it and then ground it in hand mills or crushed it in mortar. They cooked it in a pot and made it into loaves. And it tasted some, like something made with oil. They never even said what it tasted like. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine for 40 years going through eating manna? That's it. How many church cookbooks could you have with nothing but manna? <laughs> Boiled manna. Grilled manna. Roasted manna. Pot pie manna. Manna cotti. <laughs> Ding. 
<laughs> but here's what happens. There's a, a, there's a lesson for us. We can't, we can't be pointing our fingers at the Israelites because it's us. We like to hedge our bets. We want to we wanna store up the nuts for tomorrow for the winter. Right? That's what they're doing. Listen to this. Now you guys laugh, but watch. I'm not making this up. Exodus 16. And the Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much. Some gathered a little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. However, some of them, I want you to underline this. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses, and they kept part of it until morning. What does that mean? They, yeah, they gathered some. We're going to stick it under our mattresses. But what happens? But it was full of maggots. And it began to smell. Listen. God created you. He redeems you. He keeps everything going. What he asks us, what he begins to teach us, he says, I just want you to trust me. Just, just, just trust me. Now, we say that all the time, but it's really hard, right? And so God says, you know what? I, I don't want you to trust me a year in advance. That's way too much. I don't even want you to trust me six months in advance. I don't even want you to trust me for a month in advance, not even a week. I just want you to fully, completely, wholeheartedly trust me in small increments just 24 hours at a time one little step at a time gather the bread eat it and there'll be more tomorrow remember they were hungry they were thirsty that's a lot of trust and there, God's saying I just want you to, to trust me nobody gets a pass in this world as long as we're upright and sniffing air, bad things are going to happen. Part of living in a broken world. But through it all, the good and the bad and the ugly, God says, trust me. I'll get you through it, and I'll make you whole, and I'll make you better, and on the other side of heaven, there's something better waiting. The question is, is this. Who is the source of your daily strength? It's interesting that the Israelites, every day, they were gathering this manna, which was a form of bread. And they could only eat it how many days at a time? You know what, choir? I need you to help this old preacher. Doesn't Jesus teach a prayer about something about daily bread? Give us this day our daily bread it's the same thing give us this day our daily bread you see if you follow this account of the Israelites at the very end they would get to the threshold of the land of Cana to the threshold of the land of milk and honey to the threshold of the promised land and they finally made it and you know what they did they sent in ten spies and they say, we want you to go in and we want you to tell us what it's like. All ten come back and they say, it's better than what we were told. It's awesome. It's so great. You wouldn't believe it. Well, let's go in and take it. But eight out of the ten said, ah, ah, hold on. We can't. Let's go back in the desert. Back to the manna. Why? There's giants in the land. They're too big for us. We're afraid of them because they'll squash us. It actually says that. It says they'll squash us like grasshoppers. They were afraid. As a Christian living in our Christian life, 
it comes down to this. Will we live in fear or in faith? It's easy to live in fear because we have no idea what tomorrow is going to bring. There might be giants in the land. We might not get better. Things might not turn out the way we want. But can I tell you a secret? We'll never know that God is all we need until God is all we have. And then we'll know the truth. And then we'll know the truth. In fact, Jesus is a, there's a, a point that Jesus teaches us. In Mark 4, this is what happens. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. By the way, these were fishermen. These were men who were on the boat in the sea all the time. There were also other boats with them. And a furious squall came up. It's reminding me of what it was like here yesterday. I was stepping in puddles all over the place. And the waves broke over the boat. Has it ever felt like that was your life? Right? Like waves were breaking over the boat? So that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping in the cushion. The disciples woke him up and said to him, big words, folks, teacher, don't you care that I'm going to drown? Don't you care that we're going to drown? By the way, does that sound familiar? We're going to thirst to death. Back in Israel, we had lots to eat. Now we're starving to death. Why me? God, don't you care what's going on? Don't you care what's going on in my life? Don't you care about the hurt I'm feeling? About the fear I'm feeling? And Jesus got up. And he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, Quiet, be still. I want you to circle that. Quiet, be still. Please circle that. And then the wind died down and was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Don't you have any faith? Can I tell you a Garyism? Not the teachings of the Lutheran Church. Just my own thoughts. When Jesus climbed into the boat and the, the disciples, they thought they were going to drown. And they were afraid of not the giants, but the waves. Jesus says, quiet, be still. And I wonder if he wasn't so much speaking to the waves as he was speaking to the disciples. And maybe not just the disciples. Maybe when he said, be still, he was speaking to us. Be still. Be still and know that I'm God. Be still. And know that I have all these things in my hands. And I control all things. I created you. Keeping the universe going? What you're feeling, I've got that too. Because we know this. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 In his hands. It's not just a song. That's truth. And so, we put our faith in God. We don't live in fear, we live in faith. How do we do that? Because Jesus transforms us. I began my, story, my sermon with a story about a car that happened to me. I'd like to end it with another story about me in a car, if that's okay. Is that okay? When I was a little kid, until I grew up in New Jersey... And every summer, my folks would drive up, me and my, I'm the baby, my brother and my sister and me, down to the shore, the beach. In New Jersey, we call it the shore. And we would drive down the shore. Now, 
like anyone else, if my folks just drove the Garden State Parkway, we would have been there in 45 minutes. Not my folks. They drove Route 1, Route 9, all the way through every little tiny town in New Jersey until we got to Seaside Heights. Okay? As a kid, about 10 years old, what I remember is this. Right as we got into Freehold, there was this antique shop. It was called Susie's Antiques. And the reason I remember this is every time I drove by, I look out the window of the back seat and I saw Susie's Antiques and it had a big sign that said, read this, it said, we buy junk. And underneath it, there was another sign that said, we sell antiques. And I always thought, what a wonderful transformation that must take place in a little roadside shop to be able to, tra you know, to transform worthless pieces of junk into priceless antiques. But isn't that just what God does with us? He transforms us into sons and daughters of the King. And as sons and daughters of the King, we have nothing to fear. Because our Father has a thousand hills with cattle on it. And He has the whole world in His hands. And He loves you more than you could ever possibly know. And I want to end with this one last point. And if you hear nothing else, if you forget anything else that Gary Lissy ever said, if you forget Gary Lissy ever existed, I beg you, to hear this and remember this. Lean in a little bit. When you're facing tough, difficult times and you're afraid of the mountain before you, of what's facing you, what the future is going to bring, what's going to happen, and you're afraid, always remember your God who is behind you and beside you is always a billion times bigger than the fear in front of you. Because he's got this in the palm of his hand. And I would like to do one last thing. We're not, we're not Baptists, so we can't have an altar call. But I often like to have people respond in some way. So I know you don't know me, but I'm going to ask you to trust me anyway. And that is, I want everyone to close your eyes for a moment. And I want everyone to put their arms out like this and clench your fists tight. And I want you to think about one burden that you're carrying right now. One pain or hurt that you have on your heart, even if no one else knows it. One worry or fear about the future. And I want you to think about it for a moment. And then I want you to pray after me. Dear Lord, you know the burden that I'm carrying. It might be a burden that no one else even knows. But you know it. And you want to take care of it. Lord, I'm tired of trying to solve this burden myself and carrying it. So, Lord, I release it to you. Don't let me take it back. And put peace in my heart that you will take care of it. And open up your hands and let it go. And let God have it. Amen. Amen. We rise to confess our Holy Spirit-given faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, your spirit fills the world and gladdens your church with the remembrance of all Christ Jesus has spoken. Comfort us with divine peace, and do not let our hearts be troubled or afraid. Lord, in your mercy. Your prayer. Heavenly Father, as you once chose apostles to proclaim the resurrection, so open the mouths of your people to declare his praises to all who will hear. Lord, in your mercy. Your prayer. Lord God, sustain those who are mocked or persecuted for believing and confessing the truth of your word, that we may remain faithful to you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have poured out your spirit upon us that we might believe your truth and raise our sons and daughters in it. Bless all parents that we may faithfully catechize our children in your word. Lord, in your mercy. Pray. Lord of might, preserve your people from their enemies. Bring peace to the nations and prosper the cause of life. Bless our leaders, especially our president, governor, congress, legislature, and all judges and magistrates. Give them a relentless spirit, a relentless pursuit of the just laws for the common good of all, with a heart of mercy for the weak and the vulnerable. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord of compassion, forget not the sick and suffering. Grant them healing according to your will. Especially do we name before you. Give them confidence that you know their need and will, and will well supply them with all they need to endure the day of your coming. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty Father, with your Son, Jesus Christ, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts through your word to rule and govern us according to your will. Comfort us in every temptation and misfortune, and defend us against every error, that we may continue steadfast in the faith, increase in love and good works, and trusting firmly in your grace for us by his death, obtain eternal salvation through the same Jesus Christ, our, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
four days of the feast to come. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who rose beyond the bounds of death, and as he had promised, poured out your spirit of life and power upon the chosen disciples. At this the whole world exalts in boundless joy. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the very same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he given thanks, he took it and broke it. And gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, and when he had supped, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Holy things, for God's holy people. Come, the table is set, and the feast is prepared. Lois, take and eat the body of Christ given for you. What's your name again? Jackie. Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith to life everlasting.
body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you steadfast in the true faith to life everlasting.
body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you steadfast in the true faith to life everlasting. We are in his place. And now may the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you steadfast in the true The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.